Welcome back, everyone, to this episode of One Year Later or One YL. I'm Corey. And you know, this is a podcast show amplifying the voices of people taking adversity into their own hands and changing their world and the world around them. And today's guest that we're going to get to chat about his one year later is Kellen Rowe. Kellen, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, buddy. Good to see you. It's great to see you. Not a lot of people know this, but we, this is like us going on 11 years of friendship. We met freshman year at UCLA. Yeah. It's been 11 years. It's crazy. That's a long time. I haven't, a I long haven't, time. I haven't been in school in 11 years. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So a little background on Kellen. This is not about his accolades. It's more about his life, but accolades. Oh, my table just decided that it wanted to take a dip. Um, a little bit about Kellen. He has been in Major League Soccer for 10 years now. This is his 10th year in the league. Um, he likes to play... Um, more forward on the field, less backward on the field. But I'm in a, I'm saying it that way in particular because when you watch Kellen play a game of soccer, he's truly all over the field. Am I wrong? You're not wrong. The funny part about that is I'm playing defense this year. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah. See, this is I what I mean. With, but like with age, you guys just start like moving backwards because <laughs> everyone gets like really fast and like really young, and so like they. They play your position. You're just like, okay, how else do I stay on the field and stay relevant? Okay, I'll just play defense. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to take a step back, literally. It's time that's, to understand my role. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we will get to a little bit more of the transition that has yeah. happened in the last year of Kellen's life. But um, we've gotten to do some really cool things together. Like we said, went to UCLA as freshman in 2010. Um, he played some awesome, two awesome seasons at UCLA, and then he was drafted into the MLS. Um, and throughout all of that time, I've also had the honor and privilege to help guide him a little bit into his philanthropic and charitable career um, and his efforts to help cure bad days for kids fighting cancer and his alignment with the Jesse Reese Foundation to encourage them to never, ever give up. So it's been fun. And our friendship has just like had this really cool blend of never living in the same place, but getting to do really impactful stuff together. So I'm stoked to kind of get to share a little bit about what the last year has looked like for you. Obviously, professional sports was a wild thing to experience amidst a pandemic, but I'm I'm just excited to hear like what your experience was with it. It was interesting. You didn't just hold my hand. You like gave me a piggyback ride through all this. You started this. You're like, dude, just come on. Like, we can do this. I'm like, I don't know. And you're like, just hop on my back. We got this. It's true. Like, was, it, it, it was a lot of you. It's true. It's true. Okay, I'm going to just get this interview started because we need to hear about what the last year is so we can talk okay. more about the sweet stuff. So first question I always ask every guest is I want to know where were you one year ago today? <laughs> Physically, emotionally, what what oh. were you doing and what was it like? And and then we'll get to the more dirty parts of like how how what challenges you faced. But like, where were you a year ago? I was in my apartment in Boston alone yeah just not not well right not well his, his like beard a, was, was a, a lot this, longer oh man i forgot about that yeah it yeah was. i so I, I i told myself you know we got shut down in march um i think it was the second weekend of march mm -hmm. and so we weren't gonna play but well, i didn't know how severe this was i thought okay you know a few weeks in and we'll we'll get back to playing so I said, okay, I won't shave my beard and I won't cut my hair until we come back to play. I didn't realize this was gonna be a whole thing. Yeah. And it so was a whole I thing. had, yeah, I had the it was like itchy. It was like one was patchy over here, the other one was kind of flat. When I slept, it looked like I had a wave. You oh know, all, did you like have my to comb hair. your beard? Dude, oh, I had a full brush, the full <laughs> the, the mustache. I tried I curled the mustache a little bit. That was kind of cool. Um, I'll be honest, that was kind of cool. But like my, when, I woke up, when I woke up, my hair was like this way and my beard was this way. And so I was just like, how was I sleeping? Yeah. So uh, how, was I, how was I comfortable? Why was my right arm dead? My left is okay. I can feel my left leg, but not my right. I, I'm so confused here. Oh, man. Yeah. I, I had a whole beard, lot of things going on. The beard really threw you for a trip. Okay. But you, so you're in your apartment alone. Yeah. Season got shut down. Yeah. And mind you, for those of you guys that don't, know the schedule of an MLS season truly 
actual play spans from like end of March through if you make it to the MLS Cup December. So when you think about your last year, there was the opportunity with an unforeseeable future that you didn't know if you were even going to play last season. Well, we weren't, yeah, we weren't sure. We had multiple conversations with the league, um, trying to find a way to get back. And, and, you know, and there was at the moment, right when it happened or, or even a few months after that, it wasn't safe for anyone to go out and play. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a lot of guys with families. That was a big risk was, was the family aspect of things because, um, you know, n- it wasn't just us that was affected. It was, it was everyone around the family. So grandparents, parents, kids, mm-hmm. uh, any, any kind of thing. So mm-hmm. that was really tough and we weren't sure when it was going to happen. We thought the season was going to be done, which meant no pay another freak out. Um, I had a good, I had a good two day freak out on that one. I'm, I'm very sure of it. Like, you know, how do I, how do I find a way of just not being paid for six months? Uh, mm-hmm. that's. Uh, a lot of people have gone through this. I talked to a few buddies as well, and that actually happened where they didn't get paid for a month or two months. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, getting through that was hard. And so we helped as friends in any way we mm-hmm. could. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I couldn't imagine. I would have, I freaked out. Yeah. It was an for absolute sure. freak out. Yeah. So it was emotional. It was also like physically, you were very isolated. I remember seeing oh, like yeah. videos on your Instagram story of you trying to do like, dribbling drills on the hardwood of your apartment floor and like weaving and bobbing through like chairs and trying to stay keep your skills up and stay physically fit at the same time like being in your downtown boston apartment mentally i'm lucky because i didn't have anyone below me i was i was the bottom floor otherwise my neighbors would have hated me (laughs) hated me because like you 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 see these videos but they're they're like 8 a.m right like i'm i'm up i'm i'm up Right. Awake and ready to go. He, Kellen is, yeah. is like a morning person, very different than I, but he's a morning person that like makes sure that his coffee is in him, like at the latest 8 30. Like, we are, oh, immediately. You go, Do you have a timer on your coffee pot? No, I, I wake up because it gets me up. I wake up, I turn my like water on, mm-hmm. I ground my coffee, mm-hmm. and then like as my water is boiling and getting hot, that's when yeah. I like get myself awake. Okay. So it's, okay. it's it's absolute zombie dead body walking through the kitchen, getting to don't, the, the don't water. Don't talk to him. Don't talk to him until yeah. there's coffee in this. But once I once I get that first sip, oh, it's hey, gold. I appreciate, I appreciate that about you. Okay, wait. But back to the year. So obviously, yeah. with with that professional sports, I know that there was a lot of conversations with the players' association and professional mm-hmm. sports and trying to really help you guys n- navigate an unprecedented year and. So I think the next phase of what I want to chat about is like in the last year, you have faced some challenges in terms of how to play soccer, how to like stay afloat financially. But those challenges have ultimately led you into a really cool spot now. Um, Like walk us through what the challenges were and then let's talk about where the hope for the future like really came in. Wow. Um, Okay. We'll split this up into two because I've got a few, but the biggest challenge for me was those first three weeks. Yeah. Um, those first three weeks I was alone. Uh, I'm a big people person. I like talking to people. I like seeing people. I will go out and just sit at a bar and, and have dinner and talk to everyone that kind of comes through. I love that. That's my, it's one of my favorite things. Um, I couldn't do any of that. And so I was alone talking to myself. Like it was, it was bad. I had, I had a very big hit of depression the first mm-hmm. three weeks um anxiety i had you know um i contemplated if i was going to retire um that was a big one for me if i if i really loved it anymore because i didn't really miss it right uh i didn't miss going into work every day i didn't miss going to play um i had my moments you know like i said dribbling around the apartment or outside and that was that was good enough for me i didn't have to have it anything else um so that was kind of okay well what my whole life has been soccer. What else can I do? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I ended up jumping into wine studies, mm-hmm. something I was passionate about, and I got really good at that. And then actually that made me miss soccer because I, I then had two passions and I, I, I didn't know what to do with them. Um, and I ended up missing missing soccer a little more. I had somehow lost weight in quarantine uh, and got fitter. Just I don't, don't understand us, it. Don't make I, us jealous, Kellen. Don't dude, make I us don't, jealous. I don't understand it. I'm like, why can't I do that every off season instead of gaining weight every day? Right. Uh, right. But, 
but uh yeah that was the biggest challenge for me um kind of talking to myself internally what you know i'm not just the soccer player um it's been my whole life it's kind of been my personality and now it's why well, I, I you know i have to have another job i have to have another career i can i can't play soccer throughout uh my life so um you know what am i other than a soccer player that was a really big conversation with myself. So that was the biggest, I think that was the biggest struggle. Um, there's, we a got back to play. Dis- yeah. there's a lot of self-discovery that was happening amidst like, mm. like truly like that one, you, one year ago, it was like, you know, three weeks into quarantine, four weeks into quarantine. And mm-hmm. you're like, uh, what, what is this? What do I like? What, do, what don't I like about my job? Why am I not missing it? But why am I missing it? Like there is mm-hmm. so much like retrospective, like, nine years of passion that goes into that but then at the same time like you have to think forward and you have to figure out like what's the next step so the next step i want you to talk about because i think not a lot of people are talking about the bubble that existed to help mls come back to play like i think a lot of people like talked about the nba bubble in orlando but not a lot of people know that the mls went to orlando and played in a bubble on the same fields like it was yeah. ESPN wide world of sports, right? Down yeah. there. But yeah, they were right I, next to us. Yeah. Right. And I remember, you know, amongst a lot of the different storylines that were panning out on Twitter with, you know, FC Dallas being out and Nashville mm. not showing up and like those sort of things with the, those storylines. One of the things I remember from you is like, it, it was such a bubble in Orlando that you literally had to like bring your scan card into the elevator just to go get a cup of coffee downstairs. And that's how strict they were tracing every step that you guys were taking. So give me like three minutes of like what the bubble felt like in Orlando. <laughs> I, it, you know, the first week was okay. Um, because it was like, you're at a hotel and it was just fine. It was a really nice hotel. Um, the Swan and Dolphin, I think it was. All right. And oh yeah, it was it was beautiful. It was a great resort. We had our, our own yeah. resort. But after the first week, you know, you can like walk around the resort. Everyone is tested every other day and it is like a full test, like up there, get in there, uh-huh. uh, brain tickle. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. Um but it was it was tough because after that first week, it was like, you know, the soccer camp, you've been through it. You've been kind of through preseason before. That's fine, you can do that. But after the first week, you're like, okay, well. I've seen the same people. I've had the same food. I've had the same coffee. I've had the same walk. I walked around the pools and back around the resort where I could, I I would say over 50 times in the, yeah. the three weeks I was there, three and a half weeks I was there. Crazy. Like it, it, it does get really annoying. Don't get me wrong. We were treated very well. We all know yeah. that. Yeah. But it was a little bit of hell. Yeah, for sure. Because you're doing, it's, it's, it's all this repetition of the same stuff. Um, and then you're, you're having to go play as hard as you can in, you know, 95 degree weather at humidity of uh, unreal. Um, and then they pushed the games into some weird times. So we had a 9 a.m. game. We had a 10 o'clock or 1030 at night game. Like it was, yeah. it was rough. Uh, it was rough, but we, it got us back into playing. So we were okay with it because mm-hmm. then it became a somewhat of a norm normalcy um, right. later on. But that was, uh, it was very interesting. I ended up, bringing three bottles of wine with me to make sure that i'd be okay through yeah. those three weeks i figured like one a week uh that i ordered more so. yeah i was gonna say there, <laughs> there definitely had to have been a shipment that arrived a little bit later there, there was well like I, i'm a sharer and so i shared with my teammates after games and those bottles mm-hmm. went quick yeah i'm sure i'm sure okay so let's 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 talk about this picture and then let's move forward to like some turning points that like turned your year around a little bit got you back home playing in front of some like i don't i can't wait to talk about where you're at now but so the the picture was quarantine bubble of play then you weren't actually able to travel a ton in the middle of the season because they kept all of the teams you played against when you got back really regionalized. So Kellen was playing for the New England Revolution at the time up in Boston. And so you were basically making trips to DC and Philly and um, uh, New York, like Mm -hmm. constantly, that was kind of your your region. Um, And you were playing at home and there, flying in the day of the games kind of thing, just to like minimize any exposure that you would would be having, but you would still be able to play. But I'm sure amongst all of that, there was a lot of like mental battles of like, wow, we're really like going 
going through some hoops in order to make this play happen. But like oh. at the same time, it's like you knew that it was healthy for you to like be in, in play in that season. Then I'm going to fast forward a lot. You end the season and it happens to be a year where your contract was up. Is that true? Yeah. Yep. So your contract's up. And now for those of you who don't understand what being, what your contract up means, it means that like you are a free agent that potentially could be playing in and picked up in the next month or two before teams come back or you could not. Someone has to pick you up or someone has to keep you. It's this really interesting limbo. And you're basically on the phone with your agent every day to try and start to like sort sort it through. Yeah. Now, I will say, before I open the floodgate to Kellen, luckily, as he mentioned, he had really established this passion of a, a post-soccer career in wine. And he is now a level two what is it? Wine scholar? I'm going to call you. Are you a scholar? What are we... I am scholarly. I'm not a wine you... scholar, but I'm scholarly. Okay. Um, but you, you did enough to get to yeah. whatever level one and level two mean certification. Yeah. That's true. There's four. Hey. Four, four would be a diploma. So I'm halfway okay. there. Okay. We're halfway there. So he was already figuring out kind of what post soccer career would look like, but that could be 10 years from now, or it could be right after the season if he didn't get picked up. But luckily, there was a huge turning point in his life when he got picked up by a team that he has, I'll tell you personally, he has constantly told me that this is the team that he would want to go and play for if he had the opportunity. So my, my next question leading us in is what were two turning points of the last year that really instilled hope in your heart to get you to where you are today, a little less depressed, a little less anxious? Mm -hmm a little more hopeful and a little bit more excited to just explore all of the facets of your life being soccer and wine and family and all those things. So what are those two turning points if you had to identify two of them? Uh, I guess the two would be when I did sit down with myself and talk. Um, it was, you know, I, I looked back at my career and, and what I liked and what I didn't like or um, all the things that I have accomplished. And, and, um, and I think a lot of athletes will do this, especially in professional sports, is they kind of chase money. Um, you kind of chase money with your next contract because you want to make as much as you can, because at any moment it could, your career could be done. You yeah. have no idea. It could be a bad injury. It could be no one wanting your contract. It could be anything. Um, and so a lot of people chase money and I had done the same thing. I had tried to find the biggest contract and wherever that was, I would go to it. Um, and I told myself that, you know, you've had a, I've had a good career. Um, I, I've done just about everything that I've wanted to in my career. Uh, that's been reachable. And now I just want to be happy. I want to be happy playing again, like I was as a kid, like I was, um, you know, for many of my years professional, but I, at the time I wasn't. So I wanted to make sure that no matter what it was, I wanted to be happy. Yeah. And I decided um, through all the stress of not having a contract for about a month and a half after the season. So I was, I was unemployed for, I guess, a month and a half or so. I then signed back home in Seattle with the Sounders. Yeah. Ha yeah, man. When I saw that news come through, honestly, like, <laughs> I know. Honestly, the way that I found out was through this, like, gossip Twitter account that was, like, <laughs> yeah, everyone, speculate, yeah, yeah. speculating that you were going to be making the transition to, but they to Seattle. They speculate that, like, every year. The past, it's like, true. four years, they've speculated it every year. That it's true. Back. Don't get me wrong. I've tried for four years. <laughs> yeah, true, truly, truly. So you guys, Kellen um, grew up in Federal Way, Washington, and um, being back in Seattle, and now he's on a contract with Seattle for the to play for the Sounders. Sounds like he's on defense. He's like figuring out these like new rhythms in his home, um, in his hometown. He's also like gets to be the uncle that he's always wanted to be that's within pr proximity of his um, niece and nephew. And that's just like the best thing ever to be able to like kind of find all those stars aligning um, and now be in a position where you're also in wine country. I didn't really realize the Pacific Northwest had like a little bit of a wine like feeling. I knew Willamette Valley, I'll give you that. But like that's when it cool. comes to, when I yeah, but when I when I when I was thought about like Washington, like I don't know that I've ever had a bottle of wine from Washington. But <laughs> have you not? I don't know that I have, man. You definitely have. 
Oh, you know what? I, I totally have. With my I had the bottle yeah. of wine with your parents. <laughs> with your parents. Yeah. yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. But anyways, he's now getting to kind of watch all those things converge. And he's seeing that one year later, like, through a lot of perseverance and courage and patience, like, are you happy? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so happy. Yeah. I, it's I, incredible. I, I, it's... Like I, even if soccer hadn't gone well, like I had a small injury already in preseason and I was still happy. Mm -hmm. I had, you know, my folks were over here uh, actually t earlier today, <laughs> just hanging out, having a cup of coffee with me, went on a walk. Um, my sisters brought the kids up a few times. Like I, it's just, I get to see them tomorrow for Easter. It, it's, yeah. I, you know, it's, it's amazing. All the friends that I had growing up um, that I'm very close to, you know, it's not anymore of, Hey, when are you going to be back? It's, Hey, we're going to go do something. Do you want to come? Yeah. You know, it's, that's that for me, it's just the small things. Uh, and I don't think I'm ever going to get used to it because it is those small things that I've missed for nine years mm -hmm. that I just haven't had. Um, and it's, I don't care if it's raining every day. I, I don't care. I, I, I'm just happy to be home and be back on the West coast. Um, that just gives me a better feeling. Yeah. I love that. I love it. Um, so like moving forward, um, the one thing we haven't really touched on is your charitable efforts. Are you going to try to figure out some ways that we can encourage kids fighting cancer in uh, the Seattle area? We are. I love we to are. hear it. So we are linking up with the Sounders now, um, doing the best we can. We can't get kids to the game yet. Uh, no yeah. one field passes and no hospital visits yet either just because the hospitals aren't allowing anything of that sort but yep. we're going to be sending in videos um that's going to be fun we're going to try and get on some zoom calls try and cool. send some gifts uh and there's a possibility that they let me stand outside the hospital uh at a distance and say hello sure. to kids if they want to come down so that's an, that's another option but uh i've put together and just had our first final final meeting i guess uh, I've put my three loves into one basket. So I put my love of soccer, my love of wine, and my love of, of, of helping these kids out uh, all into one event. And I, I know you're like wine and kids, doesn't make sense, right? Yeah, but wine people love giving back. And so we are going to uh, link up with some of the wineries that are out here. It's, it's like you said, it's a big boom. Um, so I had, I sent about 15 emails out and I got seven back within the next day, which is pretty incredible. You got to love the support so of, cool. of the city. Uh, and so we are putting together an event and it looks like May 19th will be our first one. I love it. And everyone let's leave it there. Yeah. Let's leave, let's leave it there because I think there, <laughs> it's so we've cool. been, like Kel and I have been putting our heads together for how we can kind of converge these three loves of his heart and how we can really make an impact, especially like we're still in like some really interesting times that we can't do yeah. events normally the way that we normally would. Um, but like, all I'm gonna say is that like the heart and the pure purity of your heart to give back in the way that we're gonna be able to create, like it's gonna be epic and I can't wait for everyone to hear about it. Um, so it's gonna be so, so sweet. So, okay, Cal, the last question that I ask every guest that's on the One YL podcast is, did your one year ago self believe that you could be here one year later? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was worried, but he had faith. Good. He, but he was worried. Oh, he was worried. But yeah. great faith. I love that. I love that, man. It's so cool. Well, thanks for hopping on here, Kel. Honestly, like I, I told you before, but like it just feels like despite being still digital and like everyone's over Zoom and blah, 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 like it's still good to just like hop on and get to share your story of the last year. You know, there's so much that I could share about Kellen and who he is as a human being and who what he's done to impact so many lives. Um, but this is all about like what has happened in the last 365 days. And although it feels like there was a little dip that happened, I'm excited to see that you're on the upswing and you're, you're happy. That's really what I'm happy about. So thanks buddy. I'm happy too. 
Um, the last um, thing, I was actually getting ready for this um, interview and I have a lot of gear from the past three teams that you have played for, <laughs> but it seems as though there's nothing blue and green in my wardrobe oh, yet. So. I'm guessing you want that Jimi Hendrix one? Uh, I did. How cool if is it's, that? If it's purple, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Dude, that Jimi Hendrix jersey was sick. Uh-huh. Yeah. So cool. It's it so, so cool. sick. It's so cool. You guys, the Sounders so cool. created this homage to Jimi Hendrix with a new jersey yeah. that they're going to... Are you guys playing that as, like, your away kit or something? I think so. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm here for, I'm here for it. I'm here yeah. for it. Okay. Well, Callum, Wait, we thanks for being we on. We don't get to talk about, like, you just want me to answer all the things? What about... Yeah. What Oh, you want to know about my year? Yeah. I'll give you, I'll, I'll give everyone the, the one minute sneak peek. <laughs> Here we go. That's part of that. Honestly, that's like part of the show is the fact that like I get to talk to everyone else about their year, but like, I don't, don't really need to, to talk about yours. I don't really have to share. I don't really have to share. <laughs> you know, so the last year I would say, um, it, it was the year of just totally shifting shifting gears right and i'm beating a dead horse a little bit in that but i had an awesome time i dreamt up this idea to have an online gymnastics school last year and mm -hmm. through the online gymnastics school we were able to donate over eighty-seven thousand dollars to gyms all around the world yeah it was through the heart of um, me and two friends who just decided that in the midst of a lockdown when gyms were having to close their doors and there were still tons of kids that wanted to do the sport of gymnastics, um, as I know is near and dear to your family's heart. Um, okay. We just were very, felt very burdened that there was, the there was a potential that gyms were gonna close and kids weren't gonna ever be able to do the sport again at their home gym. And so, we created this school with 75 of our closest, nearest and dearest influential gymnastics friends, Olympians, world champions, college athletes, coaches. And we taught over a hundred live classes in 10 weeks to keep kids inspired and moving um, to continue in the sport of gymnastics. So that's honestly what I did from two days after the lockdown started all the way until the end of May. And then I needed a break. I really did. I needed like a little mental break. So I did, I took that at home because that's where you took breaks in 2020. Um, <laughs> and then after that, my family decided we were going to create a Santa Claus business, which oh, was, that was so cool. That was so cool. It was so fun. It was so fun. So without ruining any of the magic, we, you know, brought the North Pole into the home of kids all over the country and the world actually we did you know a zoom call with kids in the philippines we did a zoom call with kids in the uk um and we even actually got to do a hospital visit with the ucla children's hospital um which was so cool so overall it was the year of doing things that i had never ever dreamt that i would be doing but I am stoked and hopeful for the year to come um, to kind of get other pieces of, of, of my world in, a, in alignment to the, to the way that my dreams and goals have always been uh, heading in. And uh, we'll see where that ends up. But I'm super hopeful for the next 365. Good. Is this Santa thing going to be a yearly thing? It feels like it has to be. It, it was so good. It was beautiful, right? I I felt jolly uh -huh. after seeing it. Yeah, I was. I felt, huh, Christmas. Uh huh. I felt uh -huh. like I had, I had just like like twinkles falling off me. Yeah, we had tons of families like write to us and say like, oh. "This is now our Santa." Yeah, like yeah, one hundred percent. It has to be. It's way better than any mall Santa that they've ever experienced. Like the fact that Santa Claus would know like who your elf on the shelf is at home and know what gifts you received last year that you loved from the North Pole. Like, come on, what what could be better? Santa knew my name. I, he, Santa knew your name. He did, he did. <laughs> well, guys, can I be done? I don't like talking about myself. Yeah, I way, I, well, I, just I way like I just talking to, about you. You weren't sunburned, it was actually just you being red. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was. I was like, oh no, pressure's on. <laughs> pressure's on. That's what you put us right. Yeah, it's true. Hey, but that's when when you when you hold the power, you get you get the power. <laughs> like you just like get to do whatever you want.
That's true. Man, Kellen always makes me say things that I like don't actually want to say, but he like gets them out of me. <laughs> uh, wait until I get you a few glasses of wine in you. You're true. You're true. That's true. Yeah, chatty. I'm chatty. Chatty Kathy over there. Well, Kellen, good luck this season. Your season Thanks, starts buddy. in just a few days. We're so stoked to uh, watch that happen. Um, home opener, I believe, is the 16th of April. That's the first game, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it'll be fun to watch and see how the season plays out. I really am, like, believing for a sense of normalcy in the MLS season this year and that you all can just kind of find a rhythm and get yeah. to inspire so many people who are chasing their dreams of being a professional soccer player one day and knowing that there is a rad league that they get to play in on, in the, yeah. on the horizon. So... Um, keep doing you, and also, I can't wait till you have that full degree as a wine scholar. I will forever think of you as a wine scholar. So, thanks, buddy. You're welcome. Okay, until we get to announce that charity event that will happen at the end of May, um, this is signing out for Kellen and Corey on the One Wild podcast. But everyone, tune back in tomorrow. There'll be a rad episode with another special guest. Kel, thank you. See you, buddy. I'll see you later.